Hello. Okay. So welcome to Core Day 54. Um, we have a number of items to discuss today. Hopefully the SDM conversation will take just about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, um, but I'll be your facilitator today and going forward. So uh, get used to seeing my face from now on. Um, with that being said, I'll pass over the mic to our indexer colleagues. I'm not sure who is taking that uh, today to- I can jump in. Walk us Thanks, Lucky. Bit. Really appreciate the introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and drop in the chat a link to the FRC that we're discussing, as well as a link to the PR that represents these changes. Um, basically, we put out a very minor FRC, which includes a couple of flags for adding configurability for storage providers to um, two things to boost. One is uh, whether or not by uh, the defaults are not going to change for the present behaviors, um, but we're going to add uh, a flag that enables storage providers to not announce to the indexer if they choose to. And additionally, uh, we're going to add a flag which enables storage providers to not store um, sealed data. So, this basically just adds a layer of configurability for them that uh, during uh, the processes that they're executing, they can have a little bit of say in whether or not, for instance, deals are announced to the indexer, should they choose. Um, the default behaviors, however, won't be changing. I'll give everybody uh, maybe a minute to just kind of browse through that. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them either in chat or uh, if you'd like to ask directly. Thanks, Lofing. I'm not sure if there are immediate questions from anyone in the group. Um, if there is any, it's a good time. Otherwise, we can proceed, and then you can drop your questions or take your conversations, I think. I'll let folks have two minutes or one minute to think. Um, no. All right. Thank you so much. I will also be sharing the materials round after the meeting. So you can always uh, reach out uh, after the call if you have additional questions or comments to make. With that, I'll pass over to Irene uh, for the no buffer pull wrap uh, discussion. Over to you. Thank you. So let me start sharing the screen. I have a small presentation for you. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> and uh, by the way, sorry for the low, horrible voice, but it's flu season. I got one. Uh, I can't. I cannot share uh, the screen. Lucky, sorry. Do you need permission? Yeah, I, I got the flu, so bear with my voice. I'm sorry. Okay, now it's working. I think you can see the screen, correct? Looks and good. Please yeah, perfect. Um, please feel free to stop me for any question or even write uh, the question in chat because there are uh, other people from uh, CryptoNet that can answer while I'm speaking. Um, I'm Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Irene from CryptoNet. And uh, I'm going to you to present a couple of projects that uh, we hope can save cost for storage provider during the ceiling uh, uh, pipeline. Each project have, has some pros and cons. So we are really looking for, for feedback for your opinion, which one is the, the most impactful one. Um, more in general, like in CryptoNet, we are working on several projects uh, that we think can uh, improve the storage operation, not just uh, uh, the ceiling phase, but also maintaining storage. So please contact us and read our notion page that are open if you want to know more. But today we are going to uh, focus on the PORIP, uh, on the PORIP step, so the ceiling, uh, the ceiling phase. Uh, let's start to recap how it works today. So the first step, to add, uh, in order to add a new sector, a new CC sector, is uh, you have to do the ceiling or also call it the PC1, where the provider has to compute the labels for the SDR layer, uh, the SDR graph with, with the 11 layers. Then we have the pre-commit step, PC2, where basically 
uh, all the commitment computation is done. Uh, then there is this mandatory waiting time that is uh, 150 epochs, uh, around uh, one hour, one hour and, and, and 50 minutes, uh, where there is nothing to do. Just sit there with your uh, with some storage, but basically this, they are layers uh, stored in memory. And then finally, after the mandatory uh, waiting time, you can read uh, uh, randomness uh, from DRAND, from the DRAND network, you receive the random, and this is used to generate some challenges. Uh, and there is the proof commit step that finalizes the, the ceilings. Proof commit step is as two inside steps. First, you generate what we call the vanilla proof, and then there is the C2 step that are the, the, the proof that goes on chain are actually generated via the, the SNARK computation. Uh, hopefully, this is, this is clear, and we are on the same page here. Uh, so we are proposing three different ways to modify this, and we are targeting the to uh, the, the the cost saving that we are targeting is about uh, the storage cost of these eleven layers for this uh, storage uh, for one hundred and fifty epochs. The first idea is we call it uh, a synthetic polyp, and goes in this way: you have to do. The PC1 as today, so SDR graph has to be created as today. But before going in the in the other step, there is a new step. We call it the synthetic challenge response, where you actually select a, a super set of potential challenges. So some of the uh, nodes in the in each layer are selected. This is can be done locally. Just use COMR, like just use the computation done before. Um, you select this super set of challenge, uh, and, and uh, then you proceed to proof commit, and you will proceed later on to the next steps exactly as us today. So nothing really changes, but the big change here is that during the waiting time, you don't need to store everything as before, the 11 layers. You only need to store the Merkle tree path for the, um, for the superset that was uh, selected uh, in advance. So this in practice brings down this, uh, uh, the, the, the storage that is, is, is required to 6% uh, respect of the current one. So it's a significant reduction in storage here. Everything else stays the same. So proof commit will happen exactly as today. Um, second idea. It's non-interactive uh, polyp, we call it. Um, this is a bit different in the sense that we basically reduce the storage uh, uh, cost because we remove the waiting time at all. So basically now you do a PC1 locally. You don't need uh, any interaction with the uh, uh, DRAND. You don't need to wait any uh, um, compulsory waiting time. There is no, 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 this window of epochs. When you are done with your PC1, you can start with what today is the proof commit, C1 and C2 all together. Okay. So this is, this is a simplification that is really nice, we think, but it comes with a cost. The, how much you have to prove now, it's much more. It's around 10, uh, ten times eight, sorry, eight times uh, more than today. So in practice, C2 has a cost that is 8x. Uh, why is that? Because the randomness we use is, uh, doesn't come from DRAND anymore. It's less, less strong. So we have to improve, um, increase the number of challenges. Um, we have a fix for this, but it's not like a super short term because we can fix this 8x overhead using a testudo, using testudo. Uh, that is a new proving system that Cryptonet is, is working on. Uh, uh, and that we estimate will bring down the cost of uh, 8x stack, bring it down to today cost, basically. So equivalent to, to today. Uh, but the, 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 small, uh, the, the, the small, the, the, the small problem here is that the studio is not ready yet. So if you go with this in this direction, we have to wait first to the studio to ship. In, in this year, and then we will make, uh, we, we can use this, this approach. Uh, Ayush, you have a question, I see. 
Uh, yes, just quick question, if you don't mind. For idea two, when we say there's the 8x overhead for the proving, what is that What is that over? Are we talking about the time to generate the proof or the size of the proof itself or maybe the resources? So uh, basically, it's the same as today. It's like really the circuit is eight times bigger because it's eight times uh, the challenge. So for sure, you have more proving time um then to comp you should you, you could have also 8x the on-chain footprint but for that we already have a fix that we can use today it's called a snack pack you, you know it so you can just snack everything so this will bring the verification and proving cost a bit higher but not too much and on-chain footprint stays stays down so uh if i remember we, we do have numbers in the document maybe maybe luca can paste in the chat the numbers but i guess the 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 the, the proving overhead it's the the uh the the, the, the higher one yeah thank you welcome uh, okay so that's that's the three ideas that we have this is a visual comparison uh basically today you have these 11 layers sitting here for 150 epoch synthetic porep just reduced this to six percent uh, only non-interactive uh, remove everything but with the cost of 8x non-interactive with the studio remove everything and bring uh, the cost of snark uh, back to today uh, same information here in a table for the ones that like more, more words than, than visuals. And as I said at the beginning, the, the most important things for now, now for us is to understand which one you think is can be the most impactful in the in the short term. So please let us know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, I think I see some conversations. Okay. Uh, if you do have questions. Um, do ask, is there anyone who would like to ask anyone at the moment? Hey, Lucky, can I jump in here real quick? Yes, you can. We, uh, I'm putting a poll uh, into the chat right now based on the PO rep discussion. Uh, we've circulated this poll across storage providers, and we're looking for more feedback as to uh, which option that Irene outlined for you is the most interesting to you. Uh, and why, uh, you can always feel free to uh, DM uh, Irene or Luca as to why you picked what you did uh, in the poll, but it takes two seconds. Uh, your feedback would be highly welcome and we're aggregating this across other SP feedback. So if you could Great, do that thanks. now, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Are you do you still have a question? I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, just another quick question. Uh, this is really great. Thank you. And I really like the presentation too. Um, just quickly, what can you or any of the crypto net folks tell us about security? I assume if you're proposing it, you've already kind of convinced yourselves that it's secure, but are there any trade-offs we'd be making? Or No, basically we maintain the security level of today with all this solution or even the only one that will weak a bit is synthetic, but not significantly. So same level, same security level as today. That's why uh, we have some overhead in computation to keep the security level as today. Vic, you also have a question, I think. Yeah, thanks, Irene. Uh, the quick question I have is, um, am I right to understand that these cost reductions are primarily happening on like, let's say the hardware of, hardware level, like storage and com computation and not on the like on-chain level, like the costs and fill versus or costs in the gas economy when it comes to submitting uh, you know, except for the PCD change, uh, which is rolled into initial pledge anyway, yeah. uh, the proof commit and pre-commit stay, stay the same. It's just like the the storage costs or the the ongoing storage costs for the the SDR layers, and then maybe the cost, not the cost of sealing, uh, or uh, just want to make sure I understand that correctly. Yes, correct. So the cost, the the computational cost of PC one uh, stays the same everywhere, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. The computational cost of C2, the snack part, uh, depends, you know, uh, if you use the stud or not for an interactive. Then mm -hmm. the main save is this, uh, you know, you don't need or you need much less uh, uh, storage uh, while for, for, for storing these 11 layers for, twin, uh, for, for some period of time. So it's, okay. as you say, this hardware less, you, you, 
the, the, the requirement on AdWords is, is uh, lower. Then there are two things also that you mentioned. Let's, let's recap on that PCD. Proof commit mm -hmm. deposit. Thank you, but thanks, Kub. I forgot to mention it. Thanks, Kuba, to mention it in the chat. It's not required anymore. So there is some saving here. If we do non-interactive power app, of course. Uh, and for non-interactive power app, but there may be also the, the, the saving in the sense that you know uh, the pipeline is, is simple. You don't have this uh, sequential step, so the pipeline is a bit more simple. Maybe you can organize your machine to work in a in, in, in a more efficient way. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a bit hard to estimate uh, in general, but maybe the case, it may be nice to consider that too. If I can but, jump in, there, there's, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, if I could go ahead uh, and I'll, I'll go at three. Um, that makes sense. I guess I just, I just wanted to make sure from my understanding that like the into the costs or the, the, the gas costs for pre-commit, proof commit, PCA, PC, proof commit, so, those are all the, like the, the batching methods, that those are not touched by, by So with the non-interactive variants, the uh, pre-commit would, uh, would disappear. So like uh, would not be used anymore. I see, okay. Yeah. So the reason we have uh, pre-commit and then proof commit is because we need this round of interaction where the storage provider commits to onboarding a sector, waits for randomness and then uses that randomness uh, to onboard uh, to onboard that sector, and if they don't use that randomness and don't onboard that sector, we charge them. That's part of our security analysis for that. Uh, non interact the, the two non interactive variants allow uh, make uh, make the system non interactive, uh, as in the name, uh, which which eliminates pre, uh, pre commit completely out of the system. Uh, we would still have the the current vari variant of uh, PORAP, uh, but like f when using the new variant, we, uh, the pre commit wouldn't wouldn't be uh, wouldn't exist really. Um, and to so you have saving there, the verification cost of the proof would be a bit higher. I think on the order of. I would have to recheck the numbers, but I think no, no more than like one and a half x, two x higher verification cost of the proof itself. But uh, remember that significant portion of the gas cost of proof commit is bookkeeping, uh, which which wouldn't grow with with this, right? Like it would stay stay constant, or it it might be reduced due to lack of pre commit. Okay, sounds awesome. good. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a good way to transition back to you. Are there additional questions, by the way? Otherwise, I'll move the mic over to Vic for the next conversation we're having on SDM. No? Right. Vic, over to you. Uh, OK, thanks, Lucky. Um, let me drop a link to the chat for everyone so we're on the same page. Can everyone, can everyone get this? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, sorry, I'm also a little bit under the weather. Um, the, uh, so for the SDM, um, there are a couple updates here. Um, we talked about this a couple of core devs calls ago and decided that it would be in scope for uh, potentially an NV19. Um, Sorry. Um, so we want uh, from crypto. Tom and I and some of the authors wanted to present a kind of decision matrix that outlined uh, exactly why the current parameter space for the FIP has been chosen um, ahead of entering the last call period. Um, I think a couple of notable things to to take a look at are the first. First is that this is part of the decision matrix that was presented. In the original FIP discussion for FIP for FIP fifty six, um, the goal was to get some kind of community input, not just from core devs, but from storage providers, clients, um, uh, and, and you know, and other people within the PLN um, to see kind of where sentiment and uh, lied between in, in these parameter spaces. Um, we present this little this matrix kind of. I'll share my screen. Um, so this matrix kind of gives a sense of our reasoning as to number one, why we think presenting the FIP where upon which the sector duration multiplier policy is available upon commit replica update as well as extension 
and then allowing for sector commitments to be extended up to five years is an optimal policy. Um, also from the perspective of the uh, health of the Falcon economy, um, coupled with uh, you know, storage provider ROI. Um, so this we can kind of discuss in more in more in more detail. Um, we can go through each kind of line item, um, but I think uh, at a high level, there there are a couple of things. There are a couple of risks and issues that the FIP seeks to kind of mitigate. The first is when it comes to the health of the macro economy. What do we mean by that in general? That kind of constitutes the increases in token supply and decreases in the amount of token locked due to uh, partially due to the uh, events of like raw byte power decreasing and, and potentially expiring. So those are, are issues that the duration multiplier tries to uh, mitigate by number one, allowing for less sector churn by having longer sectors, and then also introducing incentives for those uh, sectors to be committed for longer. Um, this FIP is, it is, is uh, has always, this, the nature of this FIP has always been interesting from a community perspective, given that it's a crypto economic one and that it reduces its own challenges, which I think Caitlin will talk about a little bit more. Um, but the idea here is we've seen a little, we've seen more support for this version of, uh, of the FIP than maybe previous iterations or duration multipliers. Um, and as a result, uh, we would, we, we think that I think Caitlin and others from the foundation will release a statement um, encouraging that the center last call. We just wanted there to be transparency around exactly why this version of the FIP is the one that we are proposing after that last call period. Um, happy to answer questions here. Tom is also here on the call, um, but that is the 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 kind of that that is just the kind of summary as to uh, why like where we are now and and what we want to do in the next couple of weeks uh, before including this in MV nineteen. Thanks, Vic. Are there, are there questions? I don't think there is any in the chat. So, if there's, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. If there's um no questions um about Jenny, what Vic, sorry, Jen did have one in the document and it's staring me in the in the face. So I should I'll answer it. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Ahead. So the question the question is on economic shocks and termination incentives and why there is a potentially higher uh, induced incentive to terminate. Um, if uh, power grows quickly. The reason is because a lot of the incentive to terminate is kind of um, determined by the difference in initial pledge, by which I mean the old initial pledge that you paid when you initially committed a sector versus the new initial pledge you pay now uh, when you commit a sector, when you terminate and re-onboard that same sector. If power grows fast, um, that means a couple of things, but in general, that means a reduction in your new initial pledge because uh, if pledge is kind of proportional to your QAP, versus the QAP of the entire network. Um, when that when that denominator grows quickly, uh, you 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 pay you know proportionally less pledge. Uh, so as a, as a result, you know that termination incentive might be introduced more quickly if power grows faster. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so does yeah. also mean like that um, pledge difference. Like so, like when there's like an early termination, we charge for like termination penalty for per sector. Are we suggesting that penalty is not going to be high enough to even cover the pledge difference? To you know, so like from my understanding, it's like I would expect like per sector pledge difference is we're seeing I don't know maybe under five fill or like under two fill even. Um, and from my understanding, again, it's like ninety days of like termination pledge is a lot of way more fills than that. Um. I guess it depends on a couple of things. It depends on one, when you committed the sector initially and, and two, when you're recommitting it again. So that number can be, so right now pledges I think are around 0.2 and they've been rising for like uh, a significant period of time due to the increases in, in circulating supply. So um, like in the report, I think uh, uh, I, I think other Tom, Tom and I can, can link it uh, we show that like term incentives to terminate aren't really that pronounced. Uh, the point is just that it becomes like that if, if we're on like a sliding scale of risk, it becomes a little bit more risky if power grows very, very fast. Um, does does that answer your question or is there something else you want um, you were looking for? Okay.
Caitlin, um, you wanted to jump in? Um, yes, but only if there are no more questions for Vic okay. about the parameters, um, but I'd be happy to talk to through some of the constraints we're dealing with on the governance side and sort of the tentative plan we have at the moment to move this forward. Um, yes, there are no more questions for Vic. Um, so, so yeah, we've been talking through this. Um, I shared a link in the SDM decision matrix to the governance decision matrix. Um, if anyone else would like to see it, feel free to request access and I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, as we all know, um, crypto econ FIPS are very, very difficult to manage from a sort of community governance perspective. Um, and as we are still in this process of trying to build capacity for this decision making, um, we've outlined a couple of key ways that we can manage this FIP specifically. Um, and those three potential routes are going through the sort of soft consensus last call process that is typical to most um, technical FIPS, um, asking core devs to make the decision across the board as to whether to accept or reject, um, or launching another fill poll. Um, all of these, as you will see in the decision matrix, uh, have very strong pros and cons. Um, but I think we are kind of united that fill poll was not a good community experience. Um, it also is very, very work intensive. Um, there is also no precedent for asking core devs to make an active decision. And in the past, over the last couple of weeks in particular, uh, we've made proposals to see if that would be of interest, and we've gotten some lukewarm to negative feedback about that as well. So what we're hoping to do is to see, um, it is partially an experiment, if we can complete sort of a typical last call period for the SIP, what that would look like um, is making it very, very clear what the parameters for last call are, the two-week period, um, and also making it clear that the kinds of feedback um, that will be responded to um, needs to also fall within a set of parameters, right? These need to be unaddressed issues, they need to be coherent, and they need to be from the perspective of what is appropriate for the entire network, um, not for an individual storage provider. Um, this is going to still be a very big lift, and at the end of two weeks, getting to a point where we can say with very little quantitative input whether or not something has been accepted or rejected uh, is still going to be quite difficult, um, and we're hoping actually um, to work through what that might look like as we begin to sort of assess some of the feedback. But as Vix mentioned, it has been increasingly positive, um, especially from storage providers. Um, and what we're also hoping to do is to also organize um, some joint statements or some feedback from Filecoin Foundation, potentially also from core devs, um, outlining sort of a single position as to whether they sort of uh, would prefer to accept or reject the FIP as well. Um, so not a super elegant solution, not the best one we hope to have on a longer term horizon, um, but the best one we have for now. Um, and happy to talk through any more of like the decision making, the process, et cetera, if you have questions specifically. But I think the primary takeaway for, for devs is really asking, um, it seems as if uh, there is a little bit more um, cohesiveness or homogeneity and sort of wanting to approve the FIP. I know that is not universally the case. Um, but if that is generally the sentiment, we might look towards implementing sort of a joint statement that core devs can release as a group, um, which is a nice way of avoiding having core devs make a final governance decision on this step in particular. So I will pause there and see if anyone has any immediate feedback or questions. Yes, I think Porter and then Molly. Uh, let's start with Molly, if that's all right. Okay. Sure. Um, I was going to nudge. I think it's really useful as part of like, especially when there's many different perspectives, like being, you know, I'm reading through the entire FIP discussion all the time. And there's like tons and tons of different opinions here. I'm sure Porter um, is experiencing that and talking with SPs as well. Um, and uh, I think the decision matrix, it's a tool we've used in the past when dealing with, you know, hard uh, decisions. Sometimes these are security issue decisions or technical decisions in like Falcon governance over time. And so this has been, uh, I think that's a useful tool for us to lean into when it comes to synthesizing the pros and cons against these various different strategies. And so um, that can look like, hey, if there is, you know, a scenario five or a scenario six that should be added here, um, that we can then evaluate across these different facets that um, go into overall benefit and impact um, to the whole network. 
Um, I think that that can be a thing that comes out of um, <clears throat> the, uh, the last call period. Um, but we should also be making sure that as additional comments or points that they are like effectively captured and synthesized here, because there are a lot of trade-offs, of course, with any um, like, you know, significant change um, to especially things around crypto economics. And so um, this is a good way for us to look across many perspectives and facets and synthesize it into an overall takeaway of what is best for the network from, you know, a long-term health perspective. Um, and I think that's that's uh, a way that we can navigate through this, this time period and process is making sure that that gets um, uh, added here so that at the end of our last call period, we have clarity um, and and have used this this tool to um, make sure that we can kind of move move forward um, from a unified perspective um, as a network understanding, you know, the the trade-offs um, of that that decision. And so that's that's kind of like, I think, a, a way, Caitlin, to um, do exactly what you're suggesting, um, while also making sure that that we're able to, you know, take in the different perspectives that come with it. Because um, I do, you know, people are going to talk about their specific um, situation and, and you know, their slice of the pie. Um, but especially, you know, as we're thinking about, you know, what's what's healthy for Filecoin overall and for all of the communities and individuals involved in it, um, we definitely need to be able to have a broader system in which we weigh those things. Um, and so that that's like maybe my, my nudge or suggestion here is that we make edits and improvements and refinements to the decision matrix um, as a way of, of collectively synthesizing um, those perspectives. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's maybe my thoughts here. Yeah, I, I think it sounds good to me. I think um, also for cogency, it might be worthwhile looking into, uh, this really is very top of mind. So I'll have to think about this um, to make sure it makes sense. But um, we could put together also like a very quick, even just a notion, like a little dashboard or something that sort of summarizes all of the existing comments. Um, we don't want to ask storage providers to, you know, you have to register your approval or dismissal of the FIP again, new, et cetera. They've done this a lot. Um, but my my biggest concern still with this approach is making sure that we have a legitimate way to declare this is accepted, this is rejected at the end of that two week period. Once again, we have these timing constraints, um, which I think are kind of the nature of the difficulty of crypto econ FIPs. But yeah, Molly, we should continue to use it, uh, the decision matrix, just for the actual like structure. Um, and if, yeah, anyone has those additional pathways that they want to suggest, uh, all ears. Um, but I think, uh, I think we understand sort of the depth of constraints here pretty well so far. Um, so yeah, the wonderful thing yeah. about decision matrices, especially when, you know, weighing the things against each other is, you know, if, if this does a good job of highlighting all of the different facets of a decision, like, you know, even with very complex decisions, what's optimal often does just kind of jump out at you by um, by looking at the overall picture of things. And so um, that is that is a useful tool and sometimes a surprising tool in terms of identifying the, the best overall um, trajectory. And so being able to say, come back to this at the end of the, um, the last call period and be like, cool, like, you know, we've been updating and synthesizing um, points into this and um, you know, overall weighing all of these factors against each other, um, you know, this is what that looks like. Um, but that requires making sure that each of the, the, the facets do a good job covering all of the things that that will matter. And so things around, you know, uh, data onboarding and access to collateral are things that absolutely, you know, are of an important facet um, that, that should be in, accounted for in the decision matrix. Or did you want to also? Yeah, I, I just want to quickly add a little bit of color from deal making SPs. Uh, and I do think the challenge is short term versus long term thinking. You know, this FIP is designed for the long term health of the network. Uh, and that can be really challenging for deal making SPs to stomach sometimes. They have a very short term viewpoint. For example, like, you know, their biggest concern about the SDM is about collateral. They have a limited amount of credit. 
and they just see a you know this fixed data point and how that will translate into their actual behaviors. Mind you, you know, Stefan's team, uh, we're working on creating more options for collateral, uh, trying to raise the availability for borrowing. So in, in a future where collateral is no longer a constraint, uh, my, my hypothesis would be that this would be viewed very differently. Uh, I do think there's also some sensitivity, uh, given that we, you know, we've now been discussing this with the storage provider community for call it nine months, seven months now, nine months, uh, with Fit 36 included. And, you know, I, I do think they just want to know that they're being heard. Uh, and there's some empathy from us on, you know, if, you know, guiding them towards a longer term vision uh, and what we're trying to accomplish based on their, their short term pain points and concerns. So, you know, with any decision matrix or conversations or threads that anyone on this group is, uh, conducting with storage deal making SPs. I, I just encourage you to take an empathetic approach and that language will go a long way uh, because they do have this overwhelming feeling right now that their voices aren't being heard. I, I do think there's a lot of storage providers within the community that see this as good uh, and beneficial to them. Uh, but with the bulk of like the, the regular participants on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, there is some frustration there. So just, Go into that when you post and uh, have engagements with anyone within the, the GitHub discussion. Porter, I think that's a good flag. Um, I had wanted to also add a comment to the discussion right now um, or in the next day or two, outlining how we wanna move forward with this because the feedback I've been getting um, from some large storage providers too, is really that they really just wanna know how we're going to move forward so that they can plan around it. Um, and it would be helpful if we could collaborate on the actual language to make sure that it does come across as empathetic and it does seem geared towards making sure storage providers feel heard. Because I do, from my perspective, I think their concerns have really driven a lot of the conversation around SDM. Um, so I think they are heard, we wanna make them feel that way too, so. Great, Jennifer. Yeah, I just want to second on what K Twin has said. I talked to a couple storage provider, um, you know, different size, uh, different focus as well. A lot of them has just raised is like they would appreciate if the core devs um, can help the network get stored and like making a decision like fast and and you know storing the network moving towards it, because uh, it's more important for them to know uh, what's gonna happen in the network and how is that gonna impact their business and. Sure, like even some of them are not uh, the biggest uh, biggest fan of SDM or they have some concerns. However, um, they still understand, you know, uh, we are all trying to do the best for the network here. Uh, they just need heads up uh, to have time to adapt to the new model for the network and plan their business like accord accordingly. Uh, accordingly. So like uh, dragging along the conversation uh, for too long, can potentially has like bigger damage and impact um, to uh, in this situation. Uh, so, uh, uh, so yeah. So like I agree with Casey. It's like we can we should work like more collaboratively, uh, like you know, with uh, different ecosystem partners, understanding the situation and trying to uh, propose uh, a plan uh, to the broader community, like sooner rather than later, and try to um, drive more alignment and consensus we see in the community. Thanks, Jennifer. Are there additional comments on, on the SDM? Um, I guess this is more of an open question, but given that there seems to be kind of a more of a preference for it to seem like there will be some finality in decision-making. Um, does it make sense for some kind of last call period to be entered sooner rather than later? Um, because I think the the main concern is one of the, one of the big concerns is like drawing out the, like kind of creating a longer term, a longer process that's a little bit more uh, nebulous in terms of outcome, right? Uh, this is more directed at maybe Caitlin and Lucky, but for the group as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we've been talking about moving towards last call relatively soon. Um, 
uh, I mean, to be completely honest with you, that it, it is hard to extricate the the feedback you are getting as one person um, from what is the sentiment of the entire whole when you're not constantly working with storage providers per se. Um, but to reiterate Jennifer's point, what I have heard consistently is that at this point they have the sense that you know this is this may be a foregone conclusion. I don't want them to feel that way, but if they do. Um, eh, they seem to be more concerned with having knowledge about what will happen so that they can plan around it um, rather than negotiating the specifics of the process at this point. So to your point, yeah, I think it's important that we enter last call sooner rather than later. I think that was the plan all along. Um, but I think this gets us back to initial flag of we are going to have to navigate this process to try and mediate between giving them a decision, but not really having tools to get to hard consensus on this. Um, and one way to do that without asking for a single group to step in is to have core devs release a statement. Um, and this may be a good way to have them publicly summarize what core devs see as sort of the ma major trade off of this FIP, um, really kind of leaning into the issues that SPs have been raising over time, giving a cogent singular as a group answer as to whether or not it should be accepted or rejected. Um, and sort of kicking off the last call period um, and having that follow shortly after. Um, I think this would be a good way to guide that process. Um, but again, yeah, this is just a suggestion. Um, and some of you may not be comfortable with that or may want to talk about that a little further, but I do want to recommend it um, as something we should coordinate because I think it will help address a lot of these open issues that, that are very difficult to address, so. Great. I mean, I think, Caitlin, the, you know, when it comes to like statement overall, like, you know, I think having core devs also go through refine decision matrix, make sure we have the right set of facets there and then lean into that is like, you know, hey, summarizing these things, being able to even continue, um, you know, adding adding points through the last call process, because I'm sure even as this enters last call, they'll, they'll be um, kind of like continued points being raised across the community because um, lots of folks do have different opinions and um, using that to summarize like, hey, you know, there there is a lot of trade-offs here, but overall, like this is what that, that picture looks like. Um, do you think that can be a, uh, be that statement I mean, it's not really, it's a, it's more of like a, an analysis or summary of the, the overall landscape that's being navigated here, um, kind of on behalf of the community to help us move towards like a cohesive decision so that people can actually plan around it instead of being in this limbo state uh, for, you know, many more months. Um, and that that can kind of like help us move towards cohesive um, outcome, um, it, like is refining uh, that as a core dev group and making sure that it synthesizes all the important um, topics that are being raised? Like, can that be kind of the, the outcome here? Sure, I think, so I think we can take, so we have two decision matrix currently. We have the SDM one that Vic put together and that one seems more or less sort of static. And then we have the governance one, um, which was put together pretty quickly and should be um, more changeable. I think we should still have, we perfectly happy to like repurpose these as like, you know, core dev tools or whatever and grant access to everyone to contribute to that. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think we should not just put those forward. I think there should be, even if it's just like a few paragraphs, um, sort of providing a summary of these points and like what the outcome is. Um, one of the things we learned from the FIP 36 process is that we have a lot more time, many of us are staff on Filecoin, um, to work through these tools, but community members don't have that time and they don't want to, we saw this with the analyses, they aren't going to spend that time really digging into these things. So we should make them available as reference, um, but it also helps us in the future too, if we are capturing kind of feedback and changes and analyses as we're going through this process, um, to know that this is not going to be a set process for future crypto econ tips, hope. Um, it is an experiment to see sort of how these constraints change as we try new things. Um, and it ends up giving us really good information in the future if we want to um, make changes or do something new. Um, so I think we should use these. I think we should also have like a 
uh, something a little bit more just on the discussion posts. Here's what core devs are analyzing. Here's a link to these tools, but here's sort of the outcome we want community members to lead with. Um, and I think Porter could be really good too at helping with that. Great, thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Molly. Are there more comments? Um, otherwise, can pass that over. Jennifer, I know you wanted to touch base on NV18 and 19 quickly. Do you think we can do that in 10, five, 10 minutes? I can do that in three minutes, I hope. Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll get to you then. I feel like, you know, everyone is really you know, head down work on FEVM. So just want to share some like very quick updates um, for core dev as also like community members as well. Uh, so first, like all the all the FIPS um, that will be included in MV18, again, is only going to be FEVM surrounded. We're going to launch this huge new feature to the Falcon network. And all the FIPS uh, are in last call. Uh, right now, and I believe most of them are uh, are hoping to move out of last call uh, um, early next week. So if you do have like domain expertise on FEVM and you want to uh, help us to review the design, and uh, this is your chance, and do let us know if you have any feedback. We want FEVM to be as good as possible. And so please, please, please uh, go uh, go to the fifth repo and review them. Uh, from the engineering perspective, uh, the Ref FVM team is like doing some last a set of like uh, feature changes because like uh, we are also doing an amazing hexa uh, for space wars warp is global hexa and we're receiving a lot of feedbacks uh, from the developers themselves so there are some bugs being discovered from audits as well uh, so we're doing some like hardening and final refinement uh, on the rough fvm itself and also a lot of improvement uh, on the tooling side of the things including rpc api on the loader side uh, so uh, if uh, you are you know, if you want to help us like hardening this thing and make sure we don't screw, <laughs> screw it up, uh, please, there's a new developer focused test net called Hyperspace, and we are constantly deploying the latest code into that. So please join me us, help us testing uh, all the EVM uh, ecosystem tooling are supposed to be just working fine uh, with FVM, which is really cool. Uh, and you have any, uh, that's to, you know, ensure the Ethereum developer experience can be as good as it can be uh, so do do help us testing and get and tell us if there's any feedback so right now um um Ayush, uh yes being has been working really hard um, to start preparing all the built-in actor work and um, that's been um, done in the past seven months uh, from uh, staging them into a landable state uh, into master. And Alex North has been doing a lot of heavy lifting, but also very thoughtful like reviews on those code to make sure we, uh, we, we have like landed the protocol like safely. We could use more help on reviews, more all eyes. We are never going to turn it down. And I know a lot of the forest um, Forest friends here uh, have a lot of like relevant uh, experience as well. So if you you uh, you can help with reviewing the code, please do let us know. Uh, and that being said, uh, I, I, I believe we are still on track uh, on the code freeze next, uh, you know, sometime like next week. And the worst is like early uh, the uh, following week. Uh, and I will give another update on the precise carburetion upgrade epoch and mean that upgrade, uh, upgrade epoch uh, next week. Uh, but so far, we're still looking at early uh, March uh, as our mean at launch. So yeah, that's that. Uh, and a quick note on MV19, uh, uh, in case you haven't seen it, uh, yes, we are starting to planning the scope and the timeline of MV19. I know there's a lot of lips that's queuing up already. Um, uh, we are gonna make a small change here. There's a lot of work uh, going into each network upgrade, a lot of coordination. And we have since then pointed someone called like network um, upgrade coordinator to help store the whole process. Uh, uh, so far, like a lot of things are in my brain and I'm hoping to onboard more people to help us, you know, drive the upgrades for the network. Uh, so Caitlin has kindly offered uh, her support and help here. Uh, so Caitlin is going to be our boss uh, on shipping MV19 for the Falcon network. Uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, we are going to use this uh, opportunity to document all the process that we're taking, all the consideration. Consider 
inspiration that we are taking as well from a lot of, you know, uh, engineering governance, uh, marketing, community management, uh, communication, all those perspective. Uh, uh, so we are also keeping in mind that, you know, again, if EVM is a big change to the network, so uh, knock on the wood, uh, but it's possible that uh, we need to stay extra reactive to the potential uh, uh, incident that uh, uh, may go on to Filecoin uh, post NV18. Again, I, don't, I hope that never happens, uh, but we are going to stay uh, reactive in that. So in the case of there's any emergency upgrade needed uh, for NV19, I will still, you know, um, step in and you know help coordinating that process uh, but if everything is just if only 19 is just a normal upgrade and Caitlin is going to help store in the process if you have interest in um, being a network upgrade coordinator do you let me know uh, my hope is to onboard at least two to three uh, folks uh, to share the knowledge with me uh, so dm me if you're interested in that that's it Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, that's a, a call out there for new network um, upgrade coordinators. Um, if you want another feather added to your hat. Are there additional questions or comments um, based on Jennifer? We have uh, what Jennifer mentioned and her updates. We have just about um, six minutes to go. No. All right, thank you so much, uh, colleagues, for joining us for Core Devs number 54. Um, I'll be sharing around the notes and the recording and all of the materials that we discussed today. Um, otherwise, um, I'm hoping to see us again in March. Um, and please do take care and stay safe. Bye, guys. Bye.